Praise the Lord, everybody, and everybody praise the Lord. My name is Elder Jael Russell, International Sunday School Sergeant at Arms, and I greet you all in that wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. And as you can see, our special guest this evening is Pastor Mark Sanders, all the way from Lockport, New York. And before I hand the broadcast over to him, I want to give honor to whom honor is due. First, giving honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's ahead of my life, to our presiding apostle, Apostle James I. Clark, to our vice presider, Apostle James May, to the entire board of apostles, the entire board of bishops, the entire board of presbyters, to our advisor to the youth, Bishop Reginald Davis, to our international Sunday school superintendent, Sister Dolores Griffin, as well as the entire international Sunday school staff. Once again, I greet you all in that wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the remainder of the broadcast into the hands of Pastor Mark Sanders. Pastor Sanders, the broadcast is all yours. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. And this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice, and I will be glad in it. And we just want, we just thank God for being here um, with the International Sunday School Department of the Churches of Our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith Incorporated. And we do count it as a privilege to be with you in the name of Jesus Christ. And um, just um, Sunday school is big business. It is the it is the educational foundation of the church. And um, not just does Sunday school handle just the Bible, but we handle all issues concerning the educational process of a child of God. But the, um, tonight um, uh, we want to uh, talk about a subject that's kind of near and dear to me. And we want to uh, deal with uh, this evening on the subject of building a diverse church. You know, um, one of the things that we are called to do is to preach the gospel of the kingdom and to be witnesses of the kingdom um, uh, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, we are Pentecostal apostolics, which means uh, in so many words, we are apostolic in doctrine, Pentecostal in experience, but we also embrace the Pentecostal culture that was um, on the day of Pentecost. And the one thing that we do know about the Pentecostal church of the first century, it was diverse. And when we talk about diversity, um, we talk about a church that was diverse ethnically, a church that was um, diverse generationally. Um, and so we want to, uh, and a church that was uh, diverse socioeconomically. So we want our church to look like the church that Jesus Christ called into being. So we have a few things on our PowerPoint presentation. So we're going to advance and just get right into it. Um, we'll go right on to the next. And um, just why is it necessary to build a diverse church? Now, let me just start off by saying the Lord has um, blessed me to pastor a diverse church um, um, to his glory and to his praise. Our church is white. Our church is black. Our church is um, we have Jamaican, African, a few other nations in our church, as well as we are diverse socioeconomically. We have people that are middle class, people that are doing a little bit better than middle class, and people that are still trying to make it through this life. Um, we also have a church that is diverse generationally um, of younger people, uh, our seniors, and we and we like it that way. And I said, because it is important that we build a church that looks like the church on the day of Pentecost, because a diverse church is a fulfillment of the great commission to make disciples of all men. We don't get to pick and choose who comes to our church. We are a part of the whosoever will group. Let them come. And so it is important that we preach a gospel and present a church that um, builds up the entire, um, that builds up the entire body of Christ because a diverse church, it also reflects the love of Christ that is offered to all. You know, and I'm going to say some things uh, possibly that might rub some people the wrong way, but I know I'm in the Bible. And that's the one thing that I have to be faithful to. I don't believe, and this is in my heart, that God called the black church or the white church or the Latino church, or any other brand of churches. He only has one church. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and there's one church. And that we are responsible to preach the gospel to everybody, that no one is left out of what God is doing. Um, even let's go to the text in Matthew 28, 19. 
Um, we can go to the next slide and we can go to the word of God, Matthew 28 and 19. And the Bible says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Let me just stop right there. It says, go and teach all nations. Um, and um, Scripture talks about um, go make disciples of all nations. That word nations is not the word country. That word nations is the Greek word ethnos, where we get the word ethnicity. And so we have to, we are called to preach the gospel to every ethnic group. Um, I'm also going to say some other shocking things to you. If you can only preach to black people, you can't preach. If you can only preach to white people, you can't preach. If you can, if you can only preach to rich people, you can't preach. You can only preach to poor people. You can't preach. This gospel is universal and designed to be preached to all men. And that is our mission. That is the missio day. And the Latin, that is the mission of God, is to preach the gospel and bring the gospel to all nations. So if we're truly going to be apostolic Pentecostal, then we must build a church where everybody feels welcomed as family. Let's move on a little bit. Um, let's go, you know, um, just a few things for us to consider. Questions for us to consider is the concept of the ethnically defined church antithetical to scripture and the mission of the church? And the answer is yes. You know, I know that I am, you know, and, I, and I'm just going to say it. Uh, I, I am a proud black man. I'm a proud black man. But the one thing that I am sure of is that my my ethnicity has no bearing on the gospel. You know, I'm not trying to be anything else. But when it comes to the church, I look at the book of Acts and the book of Acts reveals to me that the church was diverse. OK, let's go. Let's go there. Let's go to the book of Acts. You know, you know what's you know what's Pentecostal apostolic. We love our acts. But let's look in the book of Acts. Let's look who was there. Let's look who was present. Um, let's start um in verse seven, Acts two and seven. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? So they were talking about the ethnicity of um the um the apostles being Palestinian Jews. And it says, and we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes, Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. We just seen, um, we just saw a plethora of ethnic groups and different groups of people and people groups that were represented on the day of Pentecost. So that's one of the things that I thank God for is this is not a white man's religion or a black man's religion, or, uh, you know, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the family of God, the ecclesia, the called out ones that do not segregate themselves based on race or gender or anything else, but we are the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's move a little bit forward. Um, and and let, we're still staying, staying right here. Let, let's go back to that. It says, so how do we deal with the racist and prejudicial history of the church in America? Uh, there is no doubt about it that the, through American history, we have dealt with racism and prejudice and all these um, different things. But the church was supposed to be the example. The church was not supposed to it was not supposed to be a part of um, the racial tension and segregation. We were called above that. That's what it is to be holy. Holy is to be separate unto God. And the church was called to be holy, to separate all those man-made divisions that divided us through history. That's why I'm so glad that the early Pentecostal movement, and we're going to get into that a little bit more in this presentation. The early Pentecostal movement was an integrated movement. Azusa wasn't a black thing. A white thing was a God thing. And it was a man by the, James, uh, by the name of James Bartleman that said that the color line was washed away by the blood. If it was relevant then, then it's relevant now. So let's go back. Let's go back. Let, let's go back up and say, so how do we deal? Uh, how does the church deal with economic inequalities in the church? Let me just tell you something. Um, when it comes to a diverse church socioeconomically, in our churches, you have people that are poor, middle class, rich. Um, the inequalities 
for those that are poor and have no food, we should provide. The Bible lets us know that they set aside money on the first day of the week. They set aside finances in the church to take care of the poor and take care of widows and orphans and those that did not have, you know, but let me just tell you something. Everybody's not going to have the same outcome, but everybody should have the same opportunities. You know, uh, there are people that have worked very hard and they have um, excelled themselves. Um, that doesn't mean that they have to take what they have and distribute it to everyone. But the early church, we saw that they gave to those that had need. That was a characteristic of the New Testament Pentecostal church is that if you had a need, the church positioned themselves to be able to help and supply those needs. So let's go back a little bit. Um, how do we address the concept of multi-generational ministry um, in our churches? Let me just tell you something. As a pastor who's been pastoring about 23 years, I don't want a church full of old people and I don't want a church full of young people. I want a church full of everybody. And ministry has to cater. Ministry has to address the needs of a multi-generational church. We have to address the needs of our seniors. We have to address the needs of our um, our um, middle age, our, our teenagers, our children, because we're just one. We're one church. And I believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can meet the needs of the congregation. Um, it, it can't be, you know, you know, you'll be in churches and we we just want it the old way. Well, we can't always do it the old way. Young people, you can't always do it the new way. You have to do it God's way. And I believe that if we seek the Lord, the Lord will give us the wisdom on how to go forward in the Lord's church. Let's go a little bit forward. You know, these are just some of the the, the, the history of America is the, the, the divided church in America. You know, it, we, you know, we cannot run away from history. We cannot run away from the inequalities and the injustices that have happened in the house of God. Um, you know, a lot of us have heard of the Azusa Street movement and the early Pentecostal movement, and a lot of that early legacy was marred with racism and, and discrimination and people that didn't want to be associated with this group. And under Jim Crow, we couldn't have fellowship the way we wanted to have fellowship. And there were divisions and there was all types of mess. And God gave it when the Holy Spirit fell. At the Azusa Street outpouring, when the Holy Spirit fell during that season, it was all people being touched by God, even though it was led by a half blind black man by the name of William Seymour. It was uh, it was being impacted by all different types of groups and nationalities that helped to usher in the presence of the Holy Ghost. That's why we we have to be bridge builders. If you want to build a diverse church, you have to be very intentional. I was intentional and I prayed. I said, Lord, I want to be a church for all people. So I wanted to minister to whites and different groups of people. And let me just say something. It is a blessing. I have I, I, I have no qualms in saying that the fastest growing demographic of my church are white families. Um, you know, and it's because I'm not building a black church. I'm building the church of Jesus Christ. And I know there's some people that so-called woke that disagree with me, but it's all right because I'm trying to do it the Bible way. I'm trying to do it the Pentecostal apostolic way is to build a church that reflects Jesus Christ, his love and his family. OK, let's go forward. Um, you know, there's something by Martin Luther King. He said, unfortunately, most of the major denominations still practice segregation in local churches, hospitals, schools and other church institutions. It is appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, the same hour when many are standing to sing, in Christ there is no East nor West, Martin Luther King Jr. But I, it, it, it shuddered to say, even though things are, have changed, they're not changing quick enough. Because we're still having, we're still a segregated time. We're still in having, um, even we've looked in the past few years, the separation um, in church politics and political um, um, endeavors of splitting down color lines. And I'm just telling you, it was not so. That is not the heart of God. The heart of God is not in the white church or the black church. The heart of God is in his church, the church that he purchased with his own blood. So let's go forward. Um, some, it, it, you know, some of the things we want to talk about is the concept of the ethically, like I said, the ethically divine church antithetical to scripture and the mission of the church. It absolutely is. 
The New Testament church in the book of Acts was diverse ethnically. We've already proven that socioeconomically because they took care of those that had need and generationally. We have seen throughout the entire books of the Bible, um, out of the entire New Testament, you know, Paul is instructing to the old women to teach the young women and the older men to teach the younger men. That's intergenerational ministry. That is us learning from each other. See, I don't want to grow up in a church with no hymns. You still need some things that come. I don't want that new Holy Ghost. I want that old-fashioned Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. I don't, I, I don't want that new Jack Holy Ghost. I want that same old Holy Ghost that they got filled with on the day of Pentecost. If there's a new Holy Ghost, I don't want it. I want the old one. I want the one that we are familiar with, the one that was recorded in Acts 2 and 4. We want the Holy Ghost that was you know, recorded throughout Scripture. So it is important that we understand that the Lord wants a church church that's diverse. Now, I understand that some of you are in areas where everybody looks like you. If you ministering like my friend in North Philadelphia, or you are ministering in a Harlem, but guess what? These neighborhoods are changing. Yo, if y'all been to Harlem lately, it's changing. It's, it's becoming every major city. And yes, some of it is happening through um, gentrification, but, they, they, but they're expanding. See, let me just tell you my own personal testimony. The Lord told me that I would not survive being a black church, but I have to open up my heart and open up my doors to everyone. And a lot of churches say we open up our hearts and doors to everyone, but no, but are you intentional? Come on, look at our outreach programs. A lot of times in the black church, our outreach program is to black people. If we look at our food programs, they are geared to people that look like us. That's why we have to come out of those silos and we have to be the true church of Jesus Christ. Let's go back. So we understand that the mission of Jesus Christ was to bring all men back into fellowship with a holy God. That's when Jesus was quoted in the book of Matthew. We are to go make disciples of all men. How many men? All men. So we have to start gearing our churches to be churches that reflect Jesus Christ. Jesus is looking for a church that looks like him. He is the head and we are the body and they must they must be joined together. You know, and, and let me just tell you something. It'll bless your ministry, bless your church. When we open up our hearts and say, we want everybody, um, we want everybody in our doors. Back up a little bit. Amen. Um, you know, so the ethnically defined church is a product of the hardness of the heart. I know it says the harness, but the ethnically defined church is a product of the hardness of the heart. If it wasn't for racism, we wouldn't have needed the black church. If it wasn't for racism, racism forced us into having our own institutions. You know, I, I had a young man ask me, he says, well, Pastor Sanders, you know, you say you don't believe, you know, why, why is there black colleges? Well, um, well, sir, well, there's black colleges because we weren't allowed in the white ones. Things were deemed necessary that we could advance. But I believe from the beginning, it was, it, it, it was not so. If we would have just got all together and didn't have all the inf evil institutions we had, there should have been one united front of a church. But that's how sin works. Sin comes to divide. The thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. And so we need to go back to the original intention of God. We know that got to the original order of Pentecost was a salvation that was given freely for every man, woman, and child. Amen. Just back. Uh, so um, let's go forward. I think we at the end, let's go forward. So you say, so how do we deal with the uh, prejudicial history of the church in America? For one, my God, we, there has to be, you know, you look at, look at this, look at this slide right there. In the midst of the Ku Klux Klan, it says over it, Jesus saves. If that is no more of a contradiction than I've ever seen, but that's what our country was birthed out of. And that's why we need massive repentance and massive forgiveness and to um, actually um, disavow from white supremacy. We have to disavow from racism and prejudice and discrimination. The Bible says clearly that God is no respecter of person. God does not, he's no respecter of person. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, black, white, or whatever it is, male or female, God is no respecter of person. He has elevated no man because in the eyes of God, we were all sinners. We, 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 we all deserve death. But God, who's rich in mercy, come on somebody, 
And that's why we thank God, because there is power. There is power in the name of Jesus Christ. There is power to pull down the walls that divide us. Let's go forward. So the question is, how could the solution become part of the problem? You know, you know, the solution for racism and discrimination was the church. We were the solution. That was proven on the day of Pentecost. It was proven in the Azusa Street outpouring that it was the church that was designed to heal the world of racism and discrimination. But instead of being the solution, we became part of the problem. Now the church became the part of the problem. So I just want to point out a few things in the apostolic Pentecostal church in perspective of race and diversity. Apostolic Pentecostals embrace the teachings and practices of the primitive church. If someone ever asks you, what does it mean to be apostolic? You can tell them something simple like this. To be apostolic means we believe in the teachings of the apostles as they were taught by Jesus Christ and the prophets. We, as, as apostolics, what the, apost what, what the apostles taught and preached is the normative for the church. So when we see the day of Pentecost and we see the ethnic diversity on the day of Pentecost, that's how it was supposed to be. We look at Philip who ministers to an Ethiopian eunuch where he is baptized and receives salvation. That was the norm. We see the apostle Peter in the house of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. And he and his whole house was filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. That's how it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to break off into our own camps, into our own tribes, but that's how it was supposed to be. Let's go back. Oneness apostolics are one of the few denominations, if that only, in this country that originated in integration. The pillars of oneness apostolics wasn't just black, wasn't just white, it was all of us. And I'm gonna show you in a little bit um, um, that from the early history in um, post, um, post Azusa Street, um, there were a lot of Trinitarians, you know, there were still people that were baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost until, um, you know, and then um, up until the um, birth of the Assemblies of God. And so between 1915 and 1919, we see a lot of integration that was leadership. It was G.T. Haywood who was preaching messages for the Assemblies of God. Some of the first white Assemblies of God uh, preachers were licensed by um, Charles Harrison Mason, who's the who was, who was one of the originators of, original founders of the Church of God in Christ, because they were a legitimate organization. So oneness Pentecostals, we started out together. We look at the structure today, the largest, the largest oneness Pentecostal group in the world is the United Pentecostal Church Incorporated. Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ, Bible Way, um, the PCAF, um, all these different groups, but we all started out together. And it's something that I think we need to consider. That was in the plan of God. I really believe, people of God, and if you're mad at me, I'm sorry you're mad at me, the original plan of God was the church was to be diverse. It was to look like the love of Christ. And so when you talk about building a, a diverse church, for one thing you have to do is you got to learn how to love and appreciate people that don't look like you. And that goes both ways, sideways, and every way. You can't hate someone and worship with them at the same time. You can't devalue someone and worship with them at the same time. You have to see me. You have to recognize the differences. You cannot ignore history. And that's either way. You cannot ignore Bible history. You cannot ignore American history. But in order, when you build a diverse church, you have to say, in so many words, we see you. We don't want you to change. We want to love you just the way you are. See, when you start building a diverse church, I'm not looking for people that we all act the same. I think that we should all express and be able to know that we're different. 
but we love each other as family just the way we are. Let's st step back a little bit. Amen. Let's go back. Um, you know, so from and racism and Jim Crow laws were a primary reason for the separation. We tried to be together. We even there was a strong out of every group that separated Baptist, Methodist. It was the apostolics that tried to keep it together. But sin is a mean thing when you allow it in the church through the sin of racism and um, legalized discrimination, such as Jim Crow. It divided the church. It divided brothers and sisters and where it just um, and in it seems like we did not fully recover from the trauma of racism and discrimination. Let's ask an honest question. How many, how many people in your church don't look like you? Now everybody, now everybody can't help how way their, their church looks. That's just who comes. But if you open up your heart and you pray and ask the Lord, Lord, use us to reach out and to save as many as we can. Why is this um, a Sunday school message? You might ask, well, you know, Sanders, why is this a Sunday school message? Because let me just tell you something. Sunday school is an evangelistic arm of the church. Sunday school, can be, hey, if you can't get them to church, invite them to Sunday school. You know, we, we invite your coworkers, bring their children, everything. So we have to have ministries that cater to diversity. And so Sunday school is a beautiful one because Sunday school ain't got no color. We're just teaching the word of God, and we invite you to participate in what God is doing in our teaching ministry. Let's go forward. You know, um, if we look at the early, and um, I'm into oneness Pentecostal history and the movement, the three most significant theologians of the early oneness Pentecostal movement were Frank Ewart, an Australian immigrant to Canada, and then to the United States, G.T. Haywood, African-American, and Andrew Urshan, an Assyrian immigrant from Persia, which is present-day Iran. The oldest surviving list of oneness ministers from 1919 contains 704 names. Of these, 29% were women, 25 to 30% were African-American, and several Hispanic names appear on the list. Once again, both black and white served in leadership. That was our history until that history was marred and mangled by racism and discrimination. And so we look at the early leaders. So in the oneness Pentecostal arena, the three major pillars, Frank Ewart, G.T. Haywood, and um, Nathaniel Urshan, mostly every oneness Pentecostal group in the country, in the world, come out of those three. One was white, one was black, and one was Persian, Iranian. Tell me that's not God. And so I believe that we need to revisit some things and to recognize, is our church lining up with what God wants, or are we just maintaining what we want? Let's go forward. So for one thing, the church, one thing, what the church must do, one is repent. If you have closed your heart, your efforts, and your resources to people that don't look like you, repent for it. Because let me just tell you something. White people are not the only bigots in the world. I have met black bigots, Latino bigots, people that just don't like people that are not like them. It's wrong, and it's sin. Call it whatever you want to. It's sin. And we need to come out of sin and be holy. The next thing we want to be is intentional. Be intentional. It, it, it's not going to happen by accident. You have to purposefully open up your heart, your church, and your ministry um, to receive others that don't look like you. Does that make any sense? Nothing happens on accident. It's going to happen because there's a purpose. Let's look at the next one. Be able to affirm the pain that the problem has caused. We have to be able to tell someone, I don't know what you're going through, but help me understand. If you are, if you are white, you might not understand how I feel, but if you're listening, 
affirm, just say, yeah, things that happened to you were wrong. And let me just tell you something. This is not just a racial thing. This is a socioeconomic. It's gender. Men, you don't know what it is to be a woman. So don't pretend like you do. Talk, sit, understand. You don't know what it is to be, you know, every old person was once upon a time a young person. And I just want us to remember that. I know sometimes as older people, we want to beat up on the young people. Look at all these girls and these mini skirts. Y'all was doing it in the 60s, the 70s. Come on, quit on, quit playing. Understand. The only thing is young people have never been old. But sometimes you got to be lovingly patient and say, you know what, to these young people, I understand. We once were young and hard-headed and spirited and sometimes even rebellious. And the last thing we want to look at in that area is we have to be able to have difficult conversations. When you start pursuing a diverse church, uh, you're going to have to have some difficult conversations, some lovingly challenging conversation because we don't see everything the same way. But that's, that's Jesus. Jesus was at the well with the woman in Samaria having a difficult conversation. It was the apostle Paul who had to challenge Peter at Antioch because of Peter's behavior with the Gentiles when the brethren came down from Jerusalem. And the Bible said that Paul was stood him to the face and challenged him. Had to have a difficult conversation. You want to build a, you want to build a uh, diverse church? Be ready for some hard talks on both sides. See, um, because I have a diverse church, I don't bring my church anywhere where my whole family aren't welcomed. That's on a local level, diocese level, and a national level. I would never expose any member of my church to a place where they were, would endure some type of harm. So we got to be prepared for some difficult conversation. Let's go to the next one. we we'll wrap this up soon. The Jesus model. John Perkins says, he said, a church that desires multi-ethnic diversity will model the paradigm of Jesus Christ. Jesus intentionally brought together disciples who were very different, fishermen, tax collectors, not people who would naturally love one another. That's the Jesus model. Jesus brought disciples together that didn't fit. You know, we, we look at people like Matthew, who was a tax collector. Probably nobody liked Matthew, <laughs> you know. Brought together different people. You had fishermen. You had people from different backgrounds. But that's the Jesus model. When Jesus sent the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, he did not use Pharisees or scholars or teachers. He used 12 plain men from Galilee in that region. That's the Jesus model. So if you just only desire to worship and love people like you, you're not much better than a Pharisee. Yeah, I had to say that. If you only desire to worship with black people, you're not much better than a Pharisee. If you don't want to worship with young people or old people or women or anything else, you're not much better than a Pharisee. Because the Holy Spirit, the gospel of Jesus Christ does not allow us to discriminate who we will share the gospel with and who we will not. Amen. Let's go to the next one. We're going to wrap this up soon. Um, building a socioeconomic diverse church can be more challenging than building a multi-ethnic church. There's a rich mindset. There's a poor mindset. Rich people think a certain way. Poor people think a certain way. And sometimes in church, that's more tension. A lot of time people are poor. Sometimes poor people take advantage of rich, loving, godly people. Come on, Brother Jackson, just loan me a few hundred dollars. I know you got it. You don't know what it is. No, we don't do that. We help one another where we can. We build up one another. But it's not, but but in, and if God has blessed us, many people don't mind sharing. That are Holy Ghost filled, they don't mind sharing. But we had, but sometimes we have to, as a church, have to show the poor better financial stewardship. And every everybody who's poor, it's not their fault. There's some, you know, if, you, if in this economy, if you are raising three children children by yourself, that is a challenge. You're raising one by yourself is a challenge. 
We look at the price of gas is going up, apartments, uh, houses, everything, everything is going up. And so we have to be mindful when we come together and just say, whether you're rich, you're poor, you're middle class, we all come together under the banner of Jesus Christ. Let's go forward. The haves and the have-nots. The first century church was economically diverse. People tend to interact more, almost exclusively with people who share similar educational histories, incomes, and occupations. And when they do interact with others from different social classes, even as friends, those relationships seem fraught with misunderstanding and tension. When it comes to spiritual needs, rich people and poor people have the same needs. Guess what? When you go evangelizing, I know it's good to go to the crack houses and the projects, but you have to go to the country clubs and the closed gate community as well with the gospel because rich people and poor people have the same spiritual needs. Rich people need Jesus. Poor people need Jesus. Let's go, let's go back. Take a look at that. And as we finish up, the church must deal with the ignorant stereotypes of both because there's ignorant stereotypes of both rich and poor, poor people always begging. That's a stereotype. Rich people got money. That's a stereotype. Just because you got a nice car don't mean you got money. You just can have a lot of debt. There's a lot of rich people swimming in debt. Rich people are not stingy. Some of the most generous people I know are people with substance, have wealth. And some of the most stingy people I've ever met in my life are poor people. But we have to know we have to dismantle the stereotypes. And let's conclude. Next slide. We'll, we'll conclude. Building multi-generational ministry. Sunday school is one of the oldest models of multi-generational ministry. Everybody grew up with the primary class and the intermediate class and the young, pe young people's class, the adult class, the senior class. It was showing that we can all learn the same gospel on different levels and what that means to us. Every generation has specific needs and the needs of one should not discount the other. The needs of the seniors are not important than the needs of the young people. The needs of the young people are not important to the seniors. Everybody has value, and everybody needs to be ministered to. You know, look at Titus 2, 1 and 2. It supports multi-general education. You know, and, and if we, you know, and if we look at um, it in reality, we can all learn something from each other. So we want to, we want to make sure that we are ministering the gospel to everyone that will hear in the name of Jesus Christ. But we thank God for this time together in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank uh, God for Pastor Jael Russell, Elder, Elder Jael Russell. Amen. Pastor someday, that young man, I know he's going somewhere because I know where he came from. But we um, thank God and we're just going to invite you to come back in in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. As we, um, we come to our uh, conclusion. But even as we do this and then Elder Russell is coming back in, we're just going to bow our heads and have a word of prayer as he comes back in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we give you praise and glory because you are the great and the mighty God. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, that there is no one like you. And we ask you, Lord God, give us the wisdom and the fortitude to build a church that you desire, not what we desire. And Lord God, we will always give you all the thanks and we will give you all the praise in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let the people of God say, amen. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Sanders. Man, that was a great workshop. I was truly blessed by it. I know that everybody watching this evening was uh, definitely blessed by it. And, you know, you fed us well tonight in the name of the Lord amen. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm, I'm full. Amen. You know, when the Lord comes back, when he wraps up this church, that's right. People won't be shocked. And it's not just going to be blacks and not just going to be whites and not just going to be Hispanics or Asians. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody, hallelujah, that wants to get saved. Hallelujah. Oh, they can be saved in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Whosoever so call upon the name of the Lord. Right. Be Amen. Saved. He doesn't want anybody to perish. Hallelujah. He mm -mm. wants all men. Oh, the Amen. Of the truth. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Oh, yes, Lord Jesus. That's what we, that's the type of God. Hallelujah. We serve in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. One scripture came to my mind. You know, as you was teaching, First John uh, chapter four, verse twenty: If a man say, "I love God," and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he mm -hmm. that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom?
whom he hath not seen. And you go to verse 21, and this commandment have we from him, that he who loved God, who loveth God, love his brother also. That's scripture. Mm -hmm. That's scripture. So, you know, we if, if, we're, if we're saying, oh, we got the love of Jesus in our hearts. Hallelujah, Jesus. And by this men shall know that you are my disciples. My disciples. That's right. You have the love toward Amen. the Amen. 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 And, and and I think that's one of the amazing reasons why, you know, it's difficult for some, you know, to reach out, you know, to uh, other cultures, other races, because that love of God is not strong, not mature enough. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. We got to be mature in the love of Jesus in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Mark, Pastor Sanders, hallelujah, was on it tonight. I just can't witness the people that look like me. Hallelujah, mm -hmm. Jesus. I can't let the white person, you know, walk by me. I can't let the Asian walk by me. Hallelujah. Then hand the track. Hallelujah. Just to the black brother or the black sister. Hallelujah. Then let yeah. the, the Hispanic male, the Hispanic family walk past me. Hallelujah. The Ethiopian family walk past me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus wants everybody saved. Hallelujah, Jesus. If my heart is right, hallelujah, for souls. Amen. Jesus, you know, all, when you look all at souls are mine. Hallelujah. I'm going to say that again. He said, all souls. All souls. When you oh, look, God. when Jesus hallelujah. said, I must needs go through Samaria. Amen. The Jews hated the Samaritans. But Amen. Jesus said, I am intentionally walking through their neighborhood because I have a destiny to meet somebody who's going to carry the, my name and carry the gospel. And we see in the book of Acts, the great revival that broke out in Samaria because the seeds were planted because Jesus said, I must needs go through. Samaria. That's why we have to, even in neighborhoods and people seem closed off to us, we have to make up in our mind, I need to go through that neighborhood. Amen. I need to meet those people because there's a Jesus they need to meet. Amen. 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 And I was, you know, fortunate, uh, you know, to go to Oral Roberts, you know, university. And, you know, that's a very diverse campus. And it was a blessing. You know, I met people from Africa, all over the world, different cultures, different races. Hallelujah. And we all have one thing in common. We love Jesus. Hallelujah, Amen. Jesus. That's all hallelujah, I need. Jesus. That's it. Yeah. When you're around, hallelujah, people that truly love God, hallelujah, they're not looking at color. They're not looking at race. You know, my, my, my white friends, we still keep in contact. You know, my people in Africa, we still keep in contact. Hallelujah, Jesus. You know, I met people in India in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But we weren't looking at race. Hallelujah. Because we was looking at Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. We got to stay focused on Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, sir. Oh, we stay focused on Jesus. Hallelujah. We're not going to see, hallelujah, you know, the race in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see the soul. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. That needs to be saved in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank Jesus. you, Jesus. Oh, yes, Thank Lord you, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, help us to grow. Oh, in your love, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to love like you. That's what you commanded us to do, to love like you. Amen. Hallelujah, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's what we got to grow up in. Hallelujah. Lord, help us tonight, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to love like you. Lord, train us to love like you. Oh, so we can show that love, hallelujah, against to anybody, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I should be able to witness to, every, to anybody. I should be able to hug anybody. I should be able to love anybody, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I truly got Jesus living in me. In the name That's of the, the Lord Jesus of Christ, hallelujah. So as you see on the screen, Sunday school is big business. Big business. Hallelujah. We are about our father's business even in the midst of a pandemic. If you like this video, which I know many of you did, hit that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And you can also use this as an evangelistic tool. You know, Elder Sanders says Sunday school is an is a, is a arm, hallelujah, of, of evangelism. And all you got to mm -hmm. do, hallelujah, just you can share this to your, to your friends and your family through text or phone. I do it all the time. I just pull up the website on my phone and just send them a text and come right to them. Hallelujah, Jesus. Make it blessed. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So, Pastor Sanders, we thank you again, uh, you know, for being a blessing. And please feel free, you know, whenever you have time, you know, to come back. We always enjoy you and we love to have you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. So, without further ado, we're about to close. I'm going to play our outro video, and the rest of you have a good night. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Be blessed. I am Karen. I attended United Refugees Church, 462 Bain Street, Orangeburg, South Carolina, where my pastor is District Elder John H. Mosley. God bless you and praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you.
times they say, but they are insistent in certain to some regret on her way. My master sent me here to tell me, see these two worlds rich and red. Well, it's not, it's lovely, brightly in that country over there. It shall be mine in the evening time. The path to walk will surely find through the one way. It is the night today that times in Jesus' name. And the Holy Ghost will enter in the evening time is not till some 